Good evening. Um, welcome to ACAP Center County's presentation on Medicare fraud. My name is Jill Lilly, and I am one of the co-coordinators here. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to tell you a little bit about ACAP. ACAP is an educational nonprofit, and we're growing nationally. We have chapters now in Pennsylvania, Georgia, and North Carolina. If you would like more information on the ACAP um, or would like to sign up for email updates, please go to www.acapcommunity.org. The ACAP Center County chapter would not be possible without the financial support of the following organizations. Penn State Health, Foxdale Village, Juniper, Center County Office of Aging, Green Hospice, and Encompass Health. We are so very grateful for their support. For those of you here in person, please check out the resource table in the back that includes our um, calendar of upcoming events. There are restrooms in the back also. And we hope that those of you who are listening at home will decide to come and attend in person at some point. I would now like to introduce Bill Wade, Senior Medicare Patrol Volunteer. Bill? All right, thank you. Thanks for inviting me this, this evening. And we're gonna talk uh, a little bit about Medicare fraud. Usually, uh, say the Senior Medicare Patrol is an organization that's administered nationally through the Medicare program. And locally, every state has a Senior Medicare Patrol. And in Pennsylvania, it's administered through an organization, nonprofit out of Philly called CARI, Center for the Advocacy for the Rights and the Interests of the Elderly. So they, in addition to administering the SMP program, they also provide assistance to seniors and uh, family members helping seniors on a large variety of subjects, transportation, housing, health care, long-term care, estate planning, lots of uh, things that sometimes seniors get involved with. So what we're going to talk, what we do this evening is I thought I would mention a couple things that you probably have read about these things. And usually when I talk to seniors and uh, uh, my background is I worked for 40 years in life and health insurance. And when I retired, Eight years ago, my wife and I moved from Wisconsin back to Pennsylvania. I'm from Maryland originally. She's from Pennsylvania. So we relocated here, and I was looking for some volunteer work. Became aware of the Senior Medicare Patrol, and I've been doing uh, presentations in the central region area of Pennsylvania for about the last six years. I also am a counselor with the Pennsylvania Medi Program, and we'll talk for a couple minutes about that also. Uh, I do, uh, just been reading up on your curriculum, I was very interested and very impressed with all the amount of information that's made available to you folks who have the difficult job of uh, managing health and medical treatment for your parents, in addition to taking care of your own families. You know, probably 10 years ago, before we moved back east, uh, my parents were in an assisted living and nursing home facility down outside of Baltimore. And I was living and taking care of my wife and daughter back in Wisconsin. So obviously it was a challenge of uh, you know, bouncing back and forth between Wisconsin and Maryland to uh, make sure things were going along with them and make sure things were okay going along in Wisconsin. So it's a very difficult task that you're uh, up against. And uh, you know, a lot of the information that's made available through this organization is very, very, should be very helpful. I wish I was aware of the information that was available 10 years ago. So in any event, uh, Thank you for wel welcoming me into make this present. First of all, real quickly, you probably are aware of some of the things that have transpired over the last two or three months. Um, I'm, I'm assuming most of your parents probably are getting Social Security. And uh, when they get their check this month, they'll be pleased to see about an 8.7% 8, 8 increase in their Social Security amount, which was the inflationary adjustment this year for all seniors who were on Social Security. Two other things uh, were announced that also will make 2023 probably from a financial standpoint one of the best years seniors have seen for a long, long time. The Medicare, you may be aware, I don't know how much you're aware of the Medicare program, but Medicare 
you know, usually most of us on Medicare uh, get Medicare Part A for free. But Medicare Part B is not free. And it usually comes out of your Social Security check. Last year, the premium went from 148 to 170, quite an increase, primarily due to a new Alzheimer's drug that initially was projected to be very costly. But after they did some further calculations later last year, they found it wasn't going to be as costly as they first thought. So this year, the Medicare Part B premium is actually decreasing from 170 to 164.90. So seniors will receive another five buck reduction when, it, when they look at their Social Security check come January. Uh, Medicare also has deductibles, Medicare Part A deductible, Medicare Part B deductible. Obviously, they usually have gone up for as long as I've been in the program, probably for eight years, the Medicare program for eight years. I think the premiums have hardly ever gone down. This year, the Medicare Part B premium was also reduced from 233 to 226. So it's not a big deal, but uh, still uh, seven, six, seven, six more dollars in your pocket. So those were good things for seniors. You may be aware that late last summer, Congress passed an Inflation Reduction Act. And there's a lot of things in there. Because obviously, when you think of $1.7 trillion, you can imagine there's a lot of things in there. But there are quite a few things in there that would be helpful to seniors going forward, primarily in the area of prescription drug costs. And obviously, uh, many of us uh, seniors uh, take medications, and medications normally aren't free. Maybe some generics you may get for free, but a lot of times drugs can be expensive. And this reduction act is basically changing how medications are handled in a variety of different ways uh, over multiple years. So it's not all going to happen next year. In 2023, the big uh, in, the big change in 2023 is a cap on insulin. So basically, if any of your parents are taking insulin, there's a $35 monthly cap that will be applied to seniors' medications for insulin. So obviously, I know we. Pennsylvania Medi, Medi program, we talk to many seniors who uh, have challenges meeting their cost for insulin. And this will be a help uh, with respect to those. That seems like a lot of money, but you know, just talking to many seniors myself at Pennsylvania Medi, many seniors spend thousands of dollars on medications. So if you're spending four or five thousand dollars a year on medications, having that annual cap of two thousand dollars will also uh, have some significant increase. And then going forward beyond that, Congress has, uh, through this bill, Congress has received the authority to negotiate drug costs with pharmaceutical companies. Up until now, medications for seniors have been not allowed to be negotiated through drug companies. So obviously they've sort of done what they want. And obviously that usually represents increased costs. So in a couple of years, they'll be able to start negotiating with pharmaceutical companies. They're gonna start with like 10 drugs to start with. And they're supposed to take the 10 drugs that are the highest volume drugs used by seniors to initiate this negotiation process. So those are some positive things that have occurred. And like I say, probably this year will probably be best year in many, many years for seniors from a financial standpoint. Okay, so uh, just want to give you updates on that. So let's jump into Medicare fraud here a little bit. Uh, I did bring some handouts, and I, I, I know the people that are on the phone here, maybe uh, maybe they can mail you out some of these handouts. But basically, what I have uh, here is a healthcare tracker brochure, which uh, gives you some info, general information about Medicare fraud, gives you some logs to keep track of the expenses that are incurred and the services rendered to your parents. There's also a couple handouts. Uh, one's called Need Help, Get Help. And of course, unfortunately, those of you on the, on the, on the line there, you won't be able to see this, but uh, basically a couple of things that are on here. And obviously, uh, when you're dealing with parents, there's a lot of issues you have to deal with. And in your curriculum, it sort of outlines quite a few of those issues. But you know, sometimes you need help. And uh, there's a, a list here of organizations where you can get some help for a variety of different things. Some of these are re repetitive of what's in your curriculum. But uh, like Carrie, I mentioned Carrie. There's a phone number here if you have issues where you want to talk to Carrie. They can provide. Most of the volunteers there are very knowledgeable about Pennsylvania law with respect to all those things that I mentioned: transportation, housing, long-term care, health care, uh, a variety of things. So obviously, 
we're fortunate to have senior centers throughout Pennsylvania. And a lot of times you can get good information locally. But if you do have a complex situation that you can't get information locally, feel free to give Curie a call. I mentioned Pennsylvania Medi, which used to be called a prize. This program is basically available to all seniors, all family members who take care of seniors. Health insurance is complicated. Even though I worked in it for 40 years and I thought I knew a little bit about it, it changes every year. So you have to constantly keep up with all the changes that take place in the Medicare program, the Medicaid program, and all the programs that uh, come into play with health insurance. So Pennsylvania Medi, you can contact them. Uh, uh, you can make us. You can set up a face-to-face -face call. You can handle a phone call. And if you have questions with respect to your parents' health insurance coverages, what options they may have, if you have claim problems, things of that nature, you can talk to Pennsylvania Medi, and there's a bunch of volunteers like myself who can sit down and talk with you and try to help you with some assistance. If you're dealing with Medicare issues, you may know already, and here again, that, that this book is the Bible for Medicare. So your parents should be getting this book every year. It's also available online. I'm sort of old tech, so I like to see paper myself, but uh, some of you folks who may be higher tech than myself can pull it up online through medicare.gov and go through this. It has pretty much all the guidelines with respect to what Medicare pays, what they don't pay, the difference between supplement plans, advantage plans, drug plans, uh, appeal procedures. There's a lot of good information under here. I think the size of the book, unfortunately, scares seniors so when it comes out every year. But obviously, if you're responsible for taking care of their health care bills, uh, knowledgeable about what insurance they get every year, this would be a good resource for you. Pick this up if you don't, if you can't find it with your in your, in your parents' home, where they're not aware of getting this, you can pick up a copy of Social Security. So if you need a copy, feel free to stop by Social Security. Do they have some here? Outdated, 2022. All right, well, this is a brand new one. <laughs> yeah. Usually this thing comes out about every October. So 2023 is the latest edition. I have, I have, I can leave this one for you here if you want. If you wanted to keep one there, I got a bunch of them at home. That'd be great. Also, one other, one other quick thing: those of you that may be AARP members, like myself, this comes out once a quarter from AARP. This has tons of information in here about Medicare programs, about fraud, about uh, financial uh, issues on how to save money with respect to seniors, things of that nature. So there's a lot of good information in here. The most recent article, pretty much the uh, most recent publication, had here some Medicare premiums to drop. So this is what I just told you with respect to all the changes that are taking place in 2023 with respect to the Medicare program. So if, you don't, if you're not an ART member, it costs $18 a year, and you get this publication once a quarter, has a lot of good information in there. So uh, I don't know whether they share them here at the senior center or not, but it, it, it's, it's a lot of good information. Okay, let's jump into fraud for a second. I, I talked about the Need Help, Get Help form. Probably two other things I probably should mention here. There's about 15 organizations on this form here. But uh, I heard you talking before about Medicare.gov. Well, obviously, you can go into Medicare.gov. If your parents are not already registered, you can register with them on Medicare.gov. You can actually go in there and find every claim that's been processed for umpteen years on this Medicare.gov. Also, there's an open enrollment period every year from October 15th to December 7th. You can actually go in there and change your parents' health care plans through that open enrollment period, and then any changes are effective January 1st. Uh, you can go in there and change prescription plans. You can change advantage plans. You can change from a supplement to an advantage plan, from an advantage plan to another advantage plan. So there's a lot of changes you can make. And, I'll be honest with you, a lot of seniors either don't want to take the time to do it or they're low tech like myself and maybe have trouble navigating through the computer. So it is a little bit complicated in navigating through there. But you pretty much go in, you register, you tell the computer what you're looking for. I'm looking for a new prescription plan in 2023. You punch in your zip code. You can actually load in all the medications that you're currently taking. They will basically sort through all the insurance companies that are offering prescription plans. 2023 and rank them by annual cost. So you pretty much see what is the cheapest plan available and what's the most expensive plan available. If your parents already have a plan, you can find their current plan and compare it to a couple other plans and make some decisions. I mean, you don't have to make a change, obviously, if you're happy with what you got, stick with it. But if you find that your your parents are covered under the most expensive plan available, there's 20 other plans that are cheaper. 
then you may want to consider a switch. All the prescription plans and all the advantage plans, I heard you talking about nursing home being ranked, and all the advantage plans and all the prescription plans are also star rated from one star to five star. One star is the lousy plans, which you probably don't want. Five stars are the best. Up until last year, Pennsylvania never had a five star plan. But last year, we started to get some five star plans in there. So I think a half dozen of them this year. And uh, you see three stars and up, you're probably going to be okay. Uh, uh, I, even though I've been in insurance for 40 years, my wife and I go through that every year, open enrollment, just double check what's available. Knock on wood, I only have one, one medication I'm taking, but she's taking quite a few. And we actually, by switching plans this year, she's going to save $1,500 wow. on her plan because the drug company that she had before, she takes Eloquist, which is a blood thinner, very expensive drug. And the prior plan was in our change the eloquence into a higher tier. Most of these drug plans have tiers, starting with generics and working up the brands and then specialty drugs. The higher the tier, the more you pay. So obviously if you can get a tier that's a three tier versus a four tier, you can save a lot of money. So here again, a lot of seniors don't want to look at it, but you can, in certain situations, you can look at it and save a lot of money. Okay, uh, the other, just two other quick forms here. There's also, on the handouts here, protect, detect, and report, which is pretty much the mantra for senior Medicare patrol. It pretty much uh, tells you how to protect yourself from being negatively impacted by Medicare fraud, how to detect errors and potential fraud, and then what do you do if you find a situation where it could be an error or could be fraud? What do you do as far as reporting? So that's the second form one here. The third handout that I have here is uh, it's pretty much a explanation of an explanation of benefits or a Medicare summary notice. If you've been dealing with your parents' um, health care bills for quite a few years, and you should have seen these explanation of benefit forms or these Medicare summary forms, if they're covered under original Medicare and a supplement plan, then basically they should get once a quarter a report from Medicare which shows all of these services that have been rendered for the last three months. What doctors they saw, what dates they were in there, what treatments were rendered, what the charges were, what Medicare paid, whether there's any balances due, all that stuff's available. Now, if they have an Advantage plan, most of us that are covered under Medicare either have Medicare and a supplement, Medicare and an Advantage plan, Medicare and a retired employer health care program. Uh, I know a lot of people in Pennsylvania who are teachers, who are Penn State employees, have a, a retiree health insurance plan, which is nice. And then, or if you were in the military, you got TRICARE and Medicare. So usually you're one of those four major buckets. But obviously, uh, each plan is a little bit different and things of that nature. But if you're in a plan that's administered through an insurance company, which is like a managed plan or a retiree health insurance plan where the insurance company is processing the claims, they send you out explanation of the benefit forms as opposed to the Medicare summary form. But the key is looking through those forms, <coughs> making certain that the claims are processed correctly. In 30, 30 of my 40 years in the insurance industry, I manage claims departments throughout, throughout the country. And usually for an insurance company to be licensed in a state, they have to provide exceptional service in processing claims, usually like 98% accuracy. So I sort of felt my, my folks who were working for me in the claim department were doing a decent job since we, since we maintain our license. But 98% is not 100%. So you could still find errors in here uh, here again, I was managing or I was vice president of claims, and he, even though I thought my people were doing a good job, I still looked at all my claims that were submitted for myself, my wife, my daughter, her parents, my parents. Probably over 30 years, I probably saved myself thousands of dollars by finding errors. So these explanation of benefit forms, uh, there's a description on here on how to look through the form and how to identify all the details on here. Okay. So that's the uh, handouts here, so I'll just leave them with Jill, and maybe if there's a handout to come out to you folks, uh, she can send these out or if you're here in the senior center, you can pick them up at the resource table. Okay, fraud. Medicare fraud uh, is a big deal. I usually tell seniors some big numbers to start with. First of all, as far as Medicare beneficiaries, there's actually, this number obviously continues to rise every year, and the number I have is 2001 number. So basically, it was about 65 million folks covered under the Medicare program as of 2021, probably up to 66, 67 million now. And Pennsylvania is about 3 million. Pennsylvania is one of the oldest states in the country. So we have a lot of Medicare beneficiaries here in Pennsylvania. So 
65 million folks are in the same boat that your parents are with respect to working through the Medicare program. Medicare pays out a lot of money for the services that are rendered to our parents for the conditions that they're getting treated for. Basically, in 2021, Medicare paid out $800 billion. That's a billion with a B, not an M. So a lot of money goes out from the Medicare program. That number is probably uh, up to eight, between 850 and 900 million in 2022, would be my guess. I think I read about uh, last year that they're expecting that number to get to $1 trillion in the next three to five years. So Medicare could be paying out a trillion dollars in benefits shortly. Now, fraud, unfortunately, is a part of that $800 billion. And usually they don't know exactly what the percentage of fraud is. But the number that they tell us to use in our presentation is about 10%. So just keep just keep the math easy. If you take 10% of $800 billion, that's $80 billion a year. That's paid out by the Medicare program. That shouldn't be paid out because claims are fraudulent. Now, usually, like I say I talk to about seven or eight counties that surround Center County. Most of us are living out here in rural central Pennsylvania. We're not living in Philly or Pittsburgh or Harrisburg. So we may think, Fraud's not going on out here in lovely rural central Pennsylvania. <laughs> but whether it is or whether it isn't, fraud impacts every Medicare beneficiary in a variety of ways. And uh, some of those I've already mentioned with respect to higher premiums. Medicare does raise that premium up normally every year. This is a rare year. Uh, I looked at the numbers from 19, from 2016 to 2023, the Medicare Part B premium went $109 to 164.90 for 2023. So you can see the number of people going up. The Medicare deductibles also go up every year. Medicare Part B was $166 back in 2016. This year it's 226. So those numbers keep going up, and basically uh, we all have to pay you know, pay those numbers. So that's one way that the government gets a little bit of the money back that they pay out. You probably have read or in the papers or heard through news, it uh, seems like uh, at least every three or four months, there's something coming out of Washington threatening that Social Security or Medicare is going to run out of money. I don't think that'll ever happen. It's sort of, as you probably can tell, it's sort of a political issue in Washington with respect to Social Security and Medicare, what they're going to do. There's lots of things they could do. And I suspect they'll do something to keep those programs viable. But obviously, most of us seniors uh, do vote. And obviously, if they expect to do something crazy with like, Social Security and Medicare, those congressmen probably won't get our vote. So I suspect that the uh, political avenue will uh, change and something will be done, most likely with politicians. They don't do anything until a year or so before it's actually going to be impacted. But here again, I don't think Social Security and Medicare is going to run out of money. But obviously, if they could reduce the fraud, if they could reduce that $80 billion <laughs> down, they could stretch out the lifespan of the, of the health care trust fund. I think the last I saw is that they were projecting that maybe in 2033, Medicare Part A could run out of money. But here again, I doubt whether that will happen, but just to give you a heads up. Medical identity theft is another thing that could be impacted by fraud. Now, most of you that have been in the program for a while, if your parents have been in the program for three or four years, you probably are aware of the fact that they got a new Medicare card about three or four years ago. The old Medicare card had our Social Security number on there. So obviously that was not a good thing. If they stole your car out of your purse or out of my wallet, they got their hands on our Social Security numbers, which was not good. You had specific identity theft issues by you know, having access to your checking account, your savings account, your visa cards, things of that nature. So that was, uh, if, you had, if you got involved in identity theft, you're talking about years in correcting that. So hopefully with the new Medicare numbers that are not Social Security numbers, it has reduced the identity theft. But you still got to be careful with your Medicare card. We're going to talk about prevention here, but basically just jump ahead a couple of minutes. Basically, the key with respect to prevention of Medicare fraud is never give out your Medicare card to strangers. But once they get their hands on your Medicare card, they got your Medicare number, and basically the Medicare number is one of the key things they need to submit fraudulent claims. So you should already be sharing that information out with your treating physicians and not with strangers who may call, knock on your door, and offer services uh, that you from a stranger that you've never seen before. Health impact. This is one area uh, that a lot of seniors are not aware of with respect to how fraud can occur. Now, you know, I talked about the fact that it's $80 billion, so from a financial standpoint, fraud is a big deal. But also, in the perpetrators who commit fraud, 
And we're talking about two, three, four percent of the total population of providers who render services. Most of the providers who are rendering services to our parents are doing a good job. We trust what they do. We trust the advice they provide our parents or ourselves. Uh, they provide direction, services, things of that nature. Unfortunately, it's that small percent of providers who try to like to cheat the government and cause the main problems with the fraud. But what they do, a lot of times, they can access the medical records for your parents. And basically, you know, if they're providing services to your parents, they already have access to your medical records, or if they don't have to provide services, if they have a few pieces of information, name, social security number, Medicare number, date of birth, there's very few pieces of information that they need to generate a Medicare claim. If you've ever seen a claim form, a Medicare claim form, it's eight and a half by 11 sheet, front and back, so a lot of information on there. But basically, the key things that are on there are diagnosis, procedure codes, and the physician information. So basically, if they get access to your parents' medical files, what they can do is change the conditions that are in that file. So say you have high blood pressure, and you go to the doctor a couple of times a year to get your blood pressure checked, and someone wants to commit fraud, they can go into the medical record of your parents and indicate that they're diabetic. Now, as far as they know, they're not diabetic, but their medical record says they're diabetic. So now, in addition to submitting claims for high blood pressure, they can submit claims to Medicare for diabetes, which obviously generates additional monies coming back to the person committing perpetrating the fraud. Another problem with that is down the road, say your parents have a new medical condition that needs to be treated. They go to a new doctor who's going to treat them for their new condition. Well, the doctor goes in there and looks at the medical record, and he sees diabetes in there. So obviously, if he thinks your parents have diabetes, he's got to be somewhat more cautious with respect to what medications he's going to give to your, to your parents for this new condition and what services he may want to render. So it can lead to future complications. You know, plus, obviously, if they submit fraudulent information, services that are rendered by Medicare could be paid out on fraudulent claims. Then when you need services at a later time that are legitimate, you may have capped out on the services that were paid out by Medicare, like therapies and things of that nature. Usually there's guidelines that Medicare has on how, how many therapy sessions you can receive for certain things. So you may get capped out on fraudulent claims. And then when you really have a limited, legitimate claim, Medicare is going to say, we already, we already paid for 20 physical therapy visits uh, last year. So we can't pay anymore. So there's the health impact to be a big deal. Okay, usually I just give a couple of examples of some situations that could occur, that most likely could occur, uh, and you just need, you need to be careful with respect to potential errors and potential fraud. Billing for services, supplies, or equipment that are not provided. So let's say you have high blood pressure. You go to the doctor's office a couple of times a year. So you go in there, say, in January or February. He takes some blood, listens to your ticker, asks you how you're feeling, looks at your medications, looks at the blood work. Everything says, well, everything looks like it's okay. We'll see you back here in four months. So you leave. A month later, you get a bill from the doctor's office. Well, you see the office visit there. You see the blood draw, all the blood work there. But you also see a charge for an MRI. <laughs> now, why are you getting a bill for an MRI? So I know, I still got my original joint. I'm not aware of any joint problems. So why am I getting a bill for an MRI? So here again, it could be an honest error. You know, it could be potentially fraud. Billing for excessive medical supplies. If you do have diabetes, then obviously, uh, you know, you're like my wife. You get the, uh, the stickers that you pretty much stick in your finger and get the number every morning and see what the number is. And if the number is not what it should be, then you have to monitor your medication, get that number down to where it should be. Usually these test strips you buy through the pharmacy, through a sort of medical equipment company, they're supposed to send you like two or three months at a time. Uh, you come home one day and on your front doorstep, there's a huge box and there's 12 months of test strips sitting on your box, sitting on your front door. Now, of course, obviously when you get our age, you know, I'm 74, you probably have parents who are 70s and 80s and things of that age. When you get our age, uh, there's no guarantee you're going to be here in 12 months. So if you pay the pharmaceutical company, the drug company, the VMAE company, for 12 months of test strips, and you pass in three, they've got paid for nine months of test strips they shouldn't have got paid for. So here again, a possibility that you know, could occur. One final one, just improper coding to obtain a higher payment. You may be aware of the fact that for office visits, there's various levels of office visits. There's a brief office visit, 15, 20 minutes, usually for chronic conditions that are not serious, that you're just monitoring your activity, things of that nature making sure things are status quo. 
it's one thing I've, as I've gotten older, it's one thing I've found that status quo is usually a good thing when you get old. But obviously, unfortunately, sometimes uh, you learn about things that you don't want to learn about. So status quo, the doctor says everything looks status quo. That's usually good good information back from the doctor's office. A middle, uh, a middle length of office visit, maybe 20, 30 minutes, maybe for more, more serious chronic condition. And then for a more serious or a new problem, the doctor may be seeing you for 45 minutes or if you have to see a new specialist, a new treatment, treating physician, that could be 45 minutes. But say you're seeing the same doctor you've seen for 10 years. You've got you know, high blood pressure, you've seen the same doctor for 10 years. You went there for a brief office visit and you get a bill for a new patient. 45 minute office visit. Now you should be thinking to yourself, why am I getting a bill for a new doctor office visit when I've been seeing the same doctor for 10 years? So here again, these are just types of examples that you just have to watch out for. Let's briefly talk about the difference between errors, abuse, and fraud. I mean, errors happen. We're all human. We all make errors. And obviously, you got, you know, most of us go to physicians who are treating uh, you know, hundreds of patients every month. So they got to submit these claim forms and send them in Medicare to get paid. And they try to train their staff to properly send in the claims. And sometimes errors are made. Usually, if it's just an honest error and you catch it, you call the doctor's office, you make them aware of the situation, they check their record, they find out, yeah, we made an error, we're sorry, they correct it, send you a revised bill, everything's hunky dory. Fraud is very hard to prove. Uh, there's one word that's the key with determining fraud, and that word is intent. So, in order to prove fraud, you have to prove that a perpetrator intentionally submitted a fraudulent claim to Medicare knowing that the claim should not be paid based on the fraudulent information that they're submitting, they're going to get paid. So they are intentionally tried to defraud the government, and the intent is where the fraud comes from. Now, abuse could lead into fraud. Usually what happens with abuse is uh, every year there's new medications, there's new lab tests, there's new surgical procedures, there's new treatments for the conditions that we have, hopefully to keep us around here a little bit longer, which is obviously a good thing. All these new procedures have codes, and the procedure code is what they call the code that's used to submit the claim into Medicare so they can get the proper payment. So they all have these new codes, so they all have to train their office staff to make sure these new codes are used when the claims are submitted. Well, some doctors do better jobs of training than others. So occasionally what will happen is the doctor will be using these new procedures and supposedly using the correct codes, but three or four months down the road, Medicare and looking at their claims, find out they're using their own codes. So basically, when they'll call the doctor's office and say, Doc, I got some bad news. We sent you $10,000 the last three months for these new procedures that you're running. We should have only sent you five. So get your checkbook out, send us a check for $5,000 for the overpayment. And make sure you get your staff together and train them so they use the right code. So that is abuse. Here again, so through some additional training, that problem usually gets corrected. It doesn't turn into fraud. Unfortunately, there's a three or four percent of providers that like to play games with the government and they'll know that if you use the old code, you're going to get 50 bucks. If you use the new code, you're going to get 25 bucks for a certain test. So they'll say, hmm, do I want 25 or do I want 50? And sometimes they'll just intentionally abuse the system, use the wrong codes, get higher money. Usually, a lot of times they get caught, but you know, they like to get that extra money for umpteen years and they, they always roll the dice as far as not getting caught. Okay, here's uh, the three biggest fraud scams that have been going on throughout the country. And like I've been doing this for six years, and these three scams haven't really changed. Uh, one would hope that you'd catch them and then things would go down, but these things are still out there to a great extent. These involve like $10, $15 billion a year. And the three biggies right now are opioid addiction. Obviously, uh, most of you are aware of the fact there's a huge problem with opioid addiction. It seems like every day in a paper room there's people dying because of opioid addiction. So obviously physicians, uh, people getting their hands on these uh, prescription pads and sending in fraudulent claims for oxycodone codone and uh, uh, you know, opioids and getting paid for illegal claim submission. Genetic testing, that has become somewhat new in recent years. Uh, most of us like to watch all these cop and robber shows on TV where people get killed a homicide and they're trying to find out the killer for the homicide and things of that nature to get DNA involved and things of that nature. 
most of you are probably been watching the news with respect to those four college students that got murdered out in Idaho and how they had supposedly uh, found the killer with respect to using DNA evidence and things of that nature. So genetic testing has gotten very popular. There are certain tests that they can perform to give you an inclination that you may be inclined to get a certain condition down the road because of your genetic history. Medicare doesn't pay for genetic tests except for one test, which is Cologuard, which is for colon cancer. That's the only genetic test that Medicare pays for. But basically what has happened because of the high cost of genetic testing and the interest in genetic testing, a lot of scams have developed where they will come out and call seniors. You'll even see RVs rolling into the mall, rolling in the church parking lot. I probably get an email every month from a company that's offering me certain tests for a couple hundred dollars. Now, most of these tests are not expensive genetic tests, but they're normal tests that if your doctor felt you needed them, you probably would have already had them done because he would have ordered them. Most of the tests aren't going to give him any more information probably to treat you than if they weren't done. But what happens is uh, you agree for $200 to get these four or five tests done, and you have to give them your Medicare card. Well, now, obviously, they get your Medicare card. They give you the four tests that you signed up and paid them $200 for, but now they submit claims to Medicare for not only those four tests that you paid $200 for, but now genetic testing that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. So now they not only get your 200 bucks, but they get thousands of dollars from the government for genetic testing that they basically you know, they submitted the claims for. And the third one is, which is probably most likely to impact more of us uh, seniors than the other two, our durable medical equipment fraud. And this has uh, become fairly big in, in the last 10, 15, 20 years. And obviously, most of us are living longer. And as we live longer, sometimes mobility becomes an issue. So we may think we need a cane, a walker, a wheelchair, you know, things of that nature. And most of these durable medical equipment companies or these companies can make fraud, they know that. They know the seniors are going to need equipment. So basically, you'll get phone calls, you'll get emails, you'll get people knocking on your door, offering you services to get you durable medical equipment. They come up with these uh, sales pitches, which sounds so good that unfortunately, uh, some seniors buy into them. And uh, usually the example I use, which is some, somewhat of a stretch, but say they come out and say, a new wheelchair just came out. This is the greatest wheelchair that's ever been manufactured. It's got AM, FM radio, it's got a mini bar, it's got air conditioning. We'll help you submit the claim to Medicare for this new wheelchair and we'll get you a 50% reduction. So basically, some of these things sound so good, and they may call thousands of seniors, and if they only get 100 to agree to go with this deal, then they're going to make money. So you set up the money, the deposit for the wheelchair, and rather than get the Cadillac, you get the Chevy, or you'll get a wheelchair that's broken. So obviously, you got to be very careful with durable medical equipment with some of the sales pitches. So big, the, the, the main message here with respect to these three fraud scams that I mentioned, is basically they all involve physician involvement. The physician's got to give you a script for the DME. The prescription theor the physician theoretically is writing the op opioid prescription. The prescription also is ordering the testing. So basically what we want to make sure that you do is rather than agree to give money or agree to sign a contract with some stranger, make sure you talk to your physician on any offers that may come through your through your through your door. So basically talk with your physician. If he feels you need a wheelchair or a walker, he'll write the script and send you to a local durable medical equipment company or pharmacy who's reliable in the community and you can get the equipment that you need. So the trick there is just don't sign anything from strangers who knock on your door, make a phone call, send you an email, things of that nature. We did have one local uh, fraud case down in Huntington and Camp Hill, which is not, you know, not too far away from Center County. This was an ambulance case. Now you're probably, if you're, hopefully your parents haven't had to use an ambulance yet, but if they do get into a situation where you need ambulance services, Medicare does pay for ambulance care, but only for serious conditions, you know, heart attacks, strokes, falls, things of that nature. Uh, they don't pay for simple, simple sprains, uh, colds, uh, minor conditions like that. This company was committing fraud. What they, what they did is they pretty much took the uh, records of patients that they were treating for some of these minor conditions, and they went into their records and changed the diagnosis codes. Basically, they changed the diagnosis codes mm -hmm. from uh, maybe a cold to COVID-19 with a severe lung complications, or they changed the code for a heart attack, or a stroke, or 
or fall with multiple fractures. So he changed his diagnosis code, submitted the ambulance claims to Medicare, and were paid billions of dollars for three, four, five years. But they were finally caught. Uh, feds investigated them, uh, uh, sent the owners to jail for uh, multiple years, and fined them eight hundred thousand dollars. So local fraud, you know, can happen, and it's hard to it's hard to detect and it's hard to catch. Let's talk briefly about detection and, and the reporting, and then we'll sort of wrap up here. Detection: How do you detect potential error or potential fraud? And really, uh, it takes some work to do it. I mean, obviously, I know, uh, like I said, I worked in health insurance for 40, 40, or 30, 40 years, so I'm used to seeing uh, claim forms, EOBs, benefit checks, things of that nature. So maybe it's a little bit easier for me to to reconcile all that documentation to make sure that the bills they said were sending my parents were correct. Now, most of us seniors don't like debt. Now, usually we get a bill, we're quick to take out the checkbook, break the check, and send the check on its way to resolve that debt. So what we would like, to, what, I, what I tell seniors when I'm talking to them, is they could take 15 or 20 minutes a month and look at their documentation and make sure that they're comfortable. Now, obviously, if they're not doing it, if you're the power of attorney and taking care of all their health insurance stuff like I was, then obviously you're the one checking all this paperwork before you get the checkbook out and write the checks. So the three things you're gonna look at, obviously if the doctors or the hospitals or the labs think your parents owe them some money, they're gonna send you a bill. So you're gonna have the bill. Two, if you have, on, and the thing that I have here is this uh, healthcare tracker. And if you, know, if you don't have the healthcare tracker, you use your phone, you can use those, you know, some uh, some seniors like a little, little, little notebook they carry around. Basically, what you want to do is keep track of all the services that are rendered to your parents. What doctors did they see? What dates did they see these doctors? What conditions did they go in to see the doctor for? What services were rendered? What charges were made? What did Medicare pay? Are there any balances due? I and mean, this is a lot of information to keep track of. I don't know about your memory, but my memory is not as good as it was 20 years ago. If I see a doctor in January and get a bill in May, am I going to remember what day was I in there? What doctor did I see? What condition did I see? What services did he render? It's hard to remember all that stuff. So if you keep track of it somehow, and then what you want to do is compare your log to the explanation of benefits, which sort of tell you all the information about the services that were rendered and the checks, Probably 95, 90, 95 percent of the time, everything will be in balance, and you'll feel good about it. And then you can write the checkbook and take care of the debt. But obviously, uh, you know, some errors can happen. So you know, if you find an error on uh, on a, if you get a bill, and let me just give you a quick example. Say you go to the doctor's office uh, in January for some uh, blood pressure check, and he did, sort of does the same thing as my prior example. He takes some blood, he runs some blood work, he checks you out, things of that nature. And the total bill is $140. So a couple months later, you get a bill for $140 from that doctor. Now, on Medicare, I, I mentioned the fact that Medicare Part B deductible is $226 this year. So you may say with $226 deductible, usually I got somebody got to pay that deductible. I got a bill for $140. $140 is less than $226. I probably owe the money. So you start to get that checkbook out and rate that check for $140. But then you realize and you think, I think I purchased some other insurance years back. And I can't remember, I'm almost sure I purchased some other insurance. And you look through your purse or through your wallet and you find an insurance card. And here's the, a card for United Health Insurance Company or, Aetna, or, or uh, uh, <clears throat> UPMC or something of that nature. And you pull that out and basically you try to resolve whether you owe that money or not. Usually what we tell folks to do. If you get a bill and you're not 100% certain you owe that money, then what you should do is one of three, one of three things. One is call the doctor's office. So in my, in my example here, you call the doctor's office and say, Doc, I bought this other insurance three years ago, and it's an Advantage plan, and it's supposed to supplement some of the benefits that are paid by Medicare. The doc looks in his system, and he doesn't have the documentation for your Advantage plan in his system. So he says, Mary, I'm sorry to say I don't have any of that information in my system. So based on what I'm looking at here, you would owe the 140. So you get off the phone with the doctor and you, know, you think about it for an hour or two. He says, I, I'm sure not 100% confident that I didn't buy some insurance that may pick up some of that 140. So the next thing you want to do is you want to call the insurance company. 
Usually you got a card in your wallet, it's got an 800 number on there, and you call the insurance company, you get in the customer service department. You give them your policy number, they check your policy number, and they said, Mary, yeah, we've got you here. You bought this Advantage plan four years ago. It supplements the benefits paid by Medicare, and you're probably aware that Medicare only paid 80%. So most of us have a supplement or an Advantage plan to pick up that 20%. So basically, uh, uh, yeah, you have a plan here that pays for the part B deductible. So basically, you tell the person you're talking about at the insurance company, I just got a bill from the doctor for 140 bucks. He doesn't have this plan in his system. And normally what the insurance companies will do is they'll call the doctor's office, give them the insurance information on the phone so the doctor's office can update their records with respect to this advantage plan that they have. And basically, the insurance company would send the doctor the check for 140 bucks. You just save yourself 140 bucks. But basically, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of times seniors just don't like paperwork. They don't want to take time to look at some of this stuff. And it's complicated, I'll, I'll admit it. Uh, but we try to convince seniors to take 15, 20 minutes a month to just look at their services rendered to be absolutely certain they're comfortable that they owe the money. If you call the doctor's office and you call the insurance company and you're still not 100% comfortable with paying that bill, well, you may look at a situation where you think, this doesn't look... This looks fishy. I'm wondering whether this could be fraud. You can actually call the SMP department, and uh, the phone numbers are on this documentation that we have here. Pretty much call the SMP department. What happens is we take the information from you, and basically what we'll do is usually call the feds in Washington. Because proving fraud, as I mentioned, is very complicated. Usually you're not going to be able to prove fraud. SMP, even if we look at the documentation, we don't do the investigation, so we can't say whether something's fraud or not. But the feds have the FBI, the CIA, they got lots of people over in DC who like to do these fancy investigations. So they would do the investigation, they determine fraud has been you know, committed, that they would prosecute, investigate, prosecute, fine, pull licenses, things of that nature. You know, just uh, just an example of something that could be fraud. I mentioned in my earlier in my presentation the fact that if you got 12 months of test strips for diabetes, that could be fraud. So if you call the SMP, provide them all the documentation, they call the feds in Washington, the feds punch in the provider information into their system, and lo and behold, they'll get 10 other complaints on the same thing in 10 different areas of Pennsylvania, but it's the same set of circumstances where these providers are sending out 12 months of test strips. And do you think that's an honest error? You know, probably not. 10 different scenarios in 10 different parts of Pennsylvania, but the same exact set of circumstances with the same provider. So they would investigate that and, and proceed accordingly. So I think quickly and just wrapping up here, I usually say if there are any questions, but if you have any questions, I'll answer any questions. <laughs> Otherwise, if, if people are sending any questions, uh, you can always contact us later. We can try to help you out with other questions. But basically, quick summary, fraud's a big deal. You know, $80 billion a year. That, that number is only going up. The feds usually do investigations. They usually save about $5 billion a year. So $5 billion is better than nothing. $5 billion is a long way from $80 billion. So always, you know, if you're talking to your congressman, you can always uh, question as to why the feds don't spend more money on fraud prevention to save, create more savings within the fraud program. Like I said, the feds do investigations. What we usually ask seniors to do is just take that 15, 20 minutes every month, look at their own documentation, make sure they're comfortable that claims are paid correctly before you send out checks for the balances. And if you do find any errors, I kind of work with the doctor's office and the insurance company to correct them. If you still have a need for assistance, feel free to call the Senior Medicare Patrol and we can provide some further assistance. So that's pretty much what I uh, covered on my presentation. So I appreciate your being here with us or calling in and listening to the presentation. And if we can provide any further assistance down the road, uh, let us know. Thank you.